What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Hammered Up Crash Course. Welcome to Saturday. Thanks for coming out on your busy weekends and see what's going on in ham radio. Hopefully we got some new people, some people who haven't taken that plunge yet into the world of amateur radio, and hopefully today helps you out a bit. We'll get started soon. Please enjoy the memes. everybody how's it going thanks for clicking on the channel clicking on the hammer to crash course i appreciate it again today we're going to be looking at ham radio from a, a new person's perspective somebody joining for the first time or interested in finding out more so we're going to try and keep it as low technical as possible we obviously have to talk about some technical issues but hopefully i do it in a way that makes a lot of sense thanks everybody in the chat there this is a live stream so there are people watching live and I expect you all to keep me honest when I start getting to the slides and getting to some work here. Now, this is an hour-long show, and there is no way that I can get you, anyone, completely up and running in amateur radio in an hour. That is just uh, too difficult to do. Uh, but there are videos and many other things on my channel that will show you more of those details if you want to. Just search, you know, when you go to the channel, there's a little magnifying glass. Just search on it for anything you're looking for, or click on the playlist, uh, Are You New to Amateur radio you know and it's got a ton of videos in there to help you out so okay what I'm gonna do is I normally give a couple of little blurbs of stuff uh, in the beginning I'll try and keep it short because you know these are these are kind of time-based anyway field day is next weekend it's always the fourth weekend of the month of June and so it'll be the 25th and 26th next week I will be at the HB races radio amateur civil emergency service uh, camp out setup that they have in Huntington Beach, California, the north side of Huntington Beach on the bluffs, uh, right by Dog Park is where they will be set up. So I will be out there. So make sure if you're interested, come on by field day, particularly if you're looking to start out in amateur radio field day is where you want to be. You definitely want to come out and watch uh, and attend and participate in field day. It is where we take our radios out into a public space usually something off grid and have kind of a mm, practice in emergency communications we generally try and run off grid when we do field day so it's always a lot of fun make sure you come out there and we run for usually 24 hours so that's generally what people do it's kind of like a contest but we don't take it too seriously anyway all right uh, link in the description. Where did it go? There it is. Link in the description to a giveaway I'm doing, which I will pick a winner. What I say? Winner will be announced July 2nd. So July 2nd, we'll announce a winner for the HRCC uh, giveaway that I'm doing, which is for one of the uh, GP7 shortwave radios. Actually, a lot more stuff, too. County Com sent me a bunch of boxes of some loot, and a lot of it I already own, and some of it I just would rather send to you all. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to do a giveaway stream on the 2nd, which is a Saturday. Okay. All right, let's dive right into this. I know you were uh, wanting to get started in amateur radio, or some of you might be, and so we'll, we'll keep this topical and to the point, and we'll have a little chit-chat at the end. Uh, if you are new in amateur radio, I highly recommend, here's a spoiler alert, if you want to really fast-track your way to ham radio understanding, consider joining our Discord server. Uh, it's pretty much 24-7. We have thousands of people that are online every day on the Discord server, and they answer a lot of questions. They help a ton of people out. Uh, I try to help people as much as I can, but you know, I'm, I actually have a job and I have kids and a family and all that stuff. So it makes it difficult, but that's where the Discord comes in. It, and it really does help a lot of people. So if you're interested, make sure to check that out. All right, so if you just got your license, congratulations. There's the first thing. So cheers to you all for getting your license. If you have no license, what is all this? And, and want to know 
what this is about. Appreciate you watching and uh, sticking with us. All right, so what is radio? First, we're going to be using a term called abstraction today. Abstraction is something that, that I use in software development. It is a term that we use often in technical spaces where we want, we want to make a complicated thing less complicated. If a box does a very, inside this box is a very complicated design, circuitry, components, et cetera, et cetera. We abstract this box to just call it a black box, for instance. And that abstraction just allows us to focus on what the box does, right? We're not worried about what's in the box. We're not worried about how the box functions right now. We just want to know what the box does. So what is radio? We're going to black box it a bit. We're going to abstract away what a radio is, what a radio does. What is it? It's a box that's transmitting energy. It is transmitting energy out of the antenna. Another box can receive that energy and take that energy and produce information from it. The information can be voice, it can be data, it can be little flashy lights, it could be whatever, right? Radio is just a way of sending energy over the air wirelessly to be received by another box that can receive that energy and do something with it. So if I hold up a handheld ham radio, key down and start talking, the information that my radio is transmitting is my voice. That's the information that's being transmitted. So if you start to abstract away some of the complexities in radio, it makes it a bit easier. In this case, it's a black box. It sends energy or receives energy. Kind of keeps it simple that way. So what are radio waves? The energy that's transmitted from the black box is oscillating, right? It goes up and down. It's a wave. The rate that the wave goes up and down is its frequency. How much of the waving it's doing is going to be expressed in the form of megahertz or the oscillation rate. This is easiest to demonstrate and think of when you think of a slinky. If you if you lay a slinky on a table and hold it out, you'll see that it's it's obviously a coil. I appreciate that. But if you were to look at it kind of as a wave, right? This oscillating up and down, up and down, up and down. Well, if I take, you know, if I grab five inches of slinky and I pull it apart, that's oscillation rate is slow. It's a low oscillation rate, low megahertz, lower frequency. If I take the slinky and I crunch it up back together, that's a very fast oscillation rate. The up and downs happen way faster in this given time period of five inches or so if you're going across versus if I took one little piece and stretched it to five inches, there's many, many less ups and downs. That's pretty much how oscillation of radio waves and what a radio waves is. That's, that's pretty much it. So when we start talking about lower frequency, and it's going to get a little confusing, <laughs> stick with me. When we start talking about the lower frequency oscillations in megahertz versus higher frequency oscillations in megahertz, now you know what I'm talking about. That's the idea. All right. I got a super chat from Frank. Great topic. Just got my call sign yesterday after waiting to receive my permanent residency, which is a must-have to get a license here. ZL4. FR. Thank you, Frank. And we got one from Bill Grant. Thank you both. Appreciate the super chat. Hello from Hall Beach, Nanavut, Nanavut, Canada, on 20 meter FT8, but I don't think I will reach you. VE7 ODA. So I'm not on FT8 yet. I'll save that for the after chat where we'll be hanging out with everybody. Um, so yeah, make sure you, uh, you hop on over to the after chat on the Discord. Go ahead and join now. It makes things easier. So we impart information onto that uh, that oscillating radio wave, right? There's a couple of ways it's done. Again, we're black boxing this. We're going to keep this easy. This is an easy way to get started in amateur radio. Our radios can take information like voice, like I already said. I'm talking into a radio. Yes, I am. And it's transmitting out via RF or data, and it modulates that onto the wave and the antenna, and the, the energy is pushed out of the antenna. That's basically what's happening. If another radio picks up that energy and is using the same mode of operation, then it will be able to reassemble that information, if you will, and play it out to you or play it to your computer appropriately. That's 
pretty much all that's happening from an abstracted sense. Now, we're not talking about how it's done. We're just saying what is done and focusing on the what is very important. Josh, insert call sign here, says, just passed my tech, just waiting on call sign. Well, congratulations, Josh. Good job. From one Josh to another, congratulations. So what is amateur radio then, right? So now we've got a, a box, a black box. It's pushing out energy. That energy is, information is contained in that energy that can be received by another box that then shoots that information at you, either as sound waves or as data or as whatever. So what's amateur radio? What does that have to do with any of this? It's really just the access space the playground, the sandbox, if you will, in megahertz where we can transmit and receive that RF energy. There are, um, we have allocations at the very wide stretched out sink, slinky low megahertz spaces all the way up to the really tightly packed slinky high megahertz spaces. And we use different radios on those different frequency spaces. The basic rule of thumb to keep in mind is that amateur radio, ham radio as it's called, is a worldwide hobby and service, and generally our frequency spaces are protected. We have allocated frequencies. Some are not all the same. Not all countries have the same frequency allocations, but we generally have spaces that we can all kind of meet on the air together and talk worldwide or send data or do whatever we want to do. There are more rules that are going to be country by country based in case you're in the United States, the FCC, or your country's governing body. But the core idea is that amateur radio is sectioned off frequency spaces for radio amateurs to transmit and no one else. That's the idea. And we are going to... Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that right now. So what is amateur radio? We're extending this out now from going from the RF spectrum, the radio spectrum, which includes the electromagnetic spectrum, which is that top left image, contains everything from very low frequencies, the radio spectrum that we use today, infrared. So now you are talking about energy in the form of infrared energy, visible light energy, ultraviolet X-ray, gamma ray, and cosmic rays. Those are all part of the same electromagnetic spectrum. RF radio frequencies, again, that energy that we're radiating out of or receiving on our radio, belongs to the electromagnetic spectrum. If you go to that lower image, it now breaks it out a little bit. We identify different megahertz spaces, again, that that oscillating wave spaces, we break that down into different names. We call them different names. The very lowest side, so really stretched out, really stretched out slinky, we call very low frequency. And where does that take you? Um, you can see 10, it, it tops out at 10, uh, just above 10 kilohertz. So not even one megahertz oscillation, 10 kilohertz, super, super wide. Okay. Um, then we get to low frequency, which takes you up about 100 kilohertz. And then you get into medium frequency and HF, which is high frequency. Now, that's the, that's the bread and butter of amateur radio. And, and we'll break this down even further. HF radio, high frequency radio, is where shortwave radio stations exist, as well as all of the frequency allocations for amateur radio. There are a ton of things that are on um, HF frequencies, and the little slices, these little playgrounds, these safe places, if you will, that we can go to as radio amateurs and use is you know pretty nice to have because it covers pretty much all of the HF bands. Ray, KQ4ATF, uh, says, Josh, met you in Dayton a few weeks ago. You, Jason, and the others, ham YouTube guys, have been instrumental in my education. Pass my general today. Hey, congratulations. Cheers on, on passing your general. Very, very nice. So as you go up from HF, you get to VHF, and that's very high frequency, right? Next to that is ultra high frequency, super high frequency. And then I believe that's extended high frequency, extra high frequency, extra high frequency. Okay. I want to make a special note here and we'll talk about this later, but it's really important to understand this point. When you go from HF to VHF, some things change with how the energy, your RF you're putting out functions. 
when you are on the lower side of HF all the way up through the higher side, your radio wave, your radio frequency energy has a chance, depending on a lot of situations, again, we're black boxing it, making it simple, of bouncing off our atmosphere and coming back down to Earth. That's called refraction. It's part of radio wave propagation. And we use that to make contacts with people, say, on the other side of the planet. When you cross from HF to very high frequency, so from high frequency to very high frequency, again, slinkies coming together, coming together, coming together, coming together into VHF, now our RF energy punches through the atmosphere and keeps on going. This is both a good thing and kind of a bad thing in the sense that good that we have the capability to refract RF when we want to by using lower frequencies, but bad in the sense that you can't use your little handy talkie most of the time to do super long distance contacts. But what does that give us? Well, VHF, UHF, and higher, all the way up to extremely high frequency, those are the frequencies that we use to communicate to things in space. Having an atmosphere bounce your RF back at you is not conducive to communicating to satellites, the ISS, whatever. So we always make sure to use, because you have to, uh, VHF, UHF signals for when we're doing amateur radio satellite or talking to the ISS, what, ha what have you. So anyway, that's, a, that's just a little bit of talk there on how and what the radio waves are. And you can see that expressed in that little rainbow section. You can see infrared is at the end there. Once you get past 100 gigahertz, you start getting into infrared energies and visible light versus RF, radio frequencies. And yeah, it's part of the same spectrum. Breaking this down now, going back to where are these little parking lots of RF spaces that are allocated for ham radio? Well, I generally break them up into two ways. ICOM apparently does too. They break it up into the VHF, UHF space and the HF high frequency space. Now, this is, uh, this is most of them, not all of them. But I, I, I'm putting this here for a reason. The leftmost image is the amateur radio VHF, UHF band plan. That is the frequency spaces, and you can see it, right? Nine uh, Here on 33 centimeters, it says 902 to 904, up to 928 megahertz. And if you go down to 2 meters, which is the 2 meter band, as we call it, it starts out at 144 megahertz and goes up to 148 megahertz. Okay? So... These bands, 23 centimeters, 33 centimeters, 70 centimeters, 1.25 centimeters, 2 meters, and 6 meters, are um, completely open, accessible to all amateur radio licenses here in the U.S. It varies in other countries, but generally all the VHF, UHF bands are completely open for any of the levels of licensing that we have in the United States. So that's good. On the right-hand side, though, things are a little bit different. When you look at HF, high frequency radio, not all of the bands are available to all of our license levels. And we'll talk about license levels in a little bit. But I want to show you and, and give you a good understanding of what we're talking about when we're talking about megahertz. So if you go back to two meters, what do we say? Two meters is 144 megahertz uh, up against 148 megahertz. So that's the bookend space. If you take your radio and turn the dial and go from 144 to 148, that's two meters. The closest high frequency band in megahertz, again, stretching that slinky out, is going to be 28 megahertz on 10 meters through 29.7 megahertz. That's the 10 meter band. 10 meters is generally best during high solar sun cycles, which is an 11 year process that we're going through right now. The high solar sun or the high, um, the energy of the sun having lots of sunspots produces more ionization that hits our atmosphere and energizes our lower layers of our atmosphere, which makes 10 meter more effective. And 10 meters really good right now. Yay, it's a good time to be a ham. You start going up in meters, so from 10 we go to 12, from 12 to 15, 17, 20. That's the length of that slinky stretching. The, the one full oscillation from peak to peak 
Peak Valley Peak is stretching out and getting longer and longer and longer. It's lower frequency, right? So when you get to my favorite band, or one of my favorite bands, 20 meters down here, we've gone from now 28 megahertz on 10 meters down to 14 megahertz on 20 meters. 14 megahertz up to 14.35 megahertz. That is the frequency range for 20 meters. I highly recommend you get and download a band plan if you are a ham radio, um, if you are ham radio licensed or ham radio curious and are interested in potentially getting a license. Go download a band plan and have it available. Print it out, keep it with you. It makes things a lot easier for reasons that we'll probably talk about a little bit. So we call these spaces, right? Look, going back a step, we call them the bands. Why do we call them the bands? Because they're expressed in meters. Bringing back the slinky again, if we say seven meters, we can go back up and look at that. Seven meters. Where's, uh, sorry, seven megahertz. Sorry, could you say that again? No. I'm having trouble hearing you. Why? Um, so 40, what did I say? 70? And you thought it was Siri? That's probably what happened. 40 meters here is seven megahertz, and it tops out at 7.300 megahertz. But we still call it 40 meters because that, again, that slinky has been stretched out to 40 meters. Oop, wrong way. So I might have wrote this wrong. Uh, so stretch a slinky to, that should be uh, 40 meters. There's no seven meter band, Josh. What are you talking about? There you go. <laughs> so stretch a slinky to 40 meters, one oscillation. That's the length, the physical length of that wave. So if I'm operating my radio on 40 meters, that is 70 me or seven megahertz. That physical RF representation is a 40 meter RF wave. So if you understand these concepts, then congrats. This is the basis of, of radio in, in most situations. This is basically how this all works, right? So if you got that, congratulations. If not, um, take some of those terms that I talked about that you may have issues with and Google them or join the Discord that I have. The Discord link is in the description. There are a lot of people that will answer your questions and uh, or comment right now. Okay. So I mentioned licenses. What's the licensing about? So ham radio in pretty much every country where ham radio is a thing and allowed, there's a licensing process. I'm not defending it at all. In fact, there's a whole slide just on talking about it. But the thought is, is that other radio services, right, if we look at GMRS and FRS in comparison to amateur radio, there's some huge differences. Two of the big ones. Other radio services, and let's just take GMRS, right? GMRS is, is super popular right now, and, and it, it deserves to be. It's, it's good. It's helpful. It's useful. Not as useful as ham radio, though. Why? So GMRS is a channel-based radio service. There are 20-something channels. You take the radio and you go channel 1, channel 2, channel 3, and you can hit scan and scan around the channels, and that's what you do. Channel the the GMRS radios generally are um, upwards are in the UHF frequency spaces, so closest to amateur radio seventy centimeter band. Amateur radios and and most HTs that most hams have are dual banded, so you get two meters and seventy centimeters. Whereas GMRS is just one band; it's channel locked and it's band locked. So if they don't seem to work for you at that time or, or you're not able to do what you need to do, that's it. Choose a new service. Get on CB. Get on FRS. Get on whatever. For most people, it's fine. They, they take it off-road. Um, they use it for being in a campground. They use it when they're on a hike. Not a big deal. Um, but but um, do keep in mind that the other radio services are channel-locked frequency lock to specific bands. And that gives amateur radio a lot of latitude because we can just pick up radios that work on different bands. If we want that bouncing our RF off the atmosphere, we get an HF radio and there we go. If we want to talk to the satellites or just go on a hike or whatever, we can use a radio like the one that's there on the left and it works just fine. That radio is, um, 70 centimeters and two meters as well. So you get both bands for the different capabilities that you may need. And why would you want different bands? Well, they all perform a little bit different. They all have a little bit of a different functionality, different capability than 
just one band. In this case, two meters generally for me has done pretty well, goes a bit further. 70 centimeters works a bit better in like a congested suburb environment. That's generally my experience. All right, so the FCC license in the U.S., it's different in other countries, is broken up into three levels. Technician, general, and extra. Technician is pretty much uh, all the VHF, UHF band spaces, frequencies. You have access to all of it. Some HF, very, very little. Some uh, HF, you get a bit of 10 meters, and you get some of the other HF bands. But the lower frequencies, again, stretched slinky frequencies, the low, low frequencies, you're restricted to Morse code only and the mode of operation that we call it, which is continuous wave. So just dits and daws for you starting out. You may not have that capability. So I appreciate not the best situation, but that's what it is right now. We'll talk about that in a little bit too. A general has access to all the amateur radio bands, all those little slices that I showed you on that ICOM sheet, all of them but reduced. They don't get access to every frequency on that band. To get every frequency, you need your extra license, and extra is the last step, the highest level, and gives you access to everything in the United States license. So appreciate that. Spud says, hey, great uh, presentation, KI5MMFF. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, my advice is go ahead and get your technician um, and general in one sitting, if you can. I feel that, I have felt, and I continue to feel, <laughs> that HF is where it's at. I, I love I love VHF, UHF. I love all ham radio. There's no, there's no denying that. But I have the most fun on HF, high-frequency ham radio. I like to make those long contacts. I like to see other interesting countries appear on my waterfall or hear their voice come over the speaker. HF is the best. It's also what you need generally if you're going to participate in the many of amateur radio games that we have. I call them amateur radio games. People probably don't like that. But if you've ever heard of Parks on the Air or Summits on the Air, where we go to a national a state or national park or the top of a high summit and activate our radios activate meaning turn them on set them up make four or ten contacts depending on if you're talking about soda or um poda then you basically get points unlocking or activating points for that given location now you can make this work with vhf and uhf it's a little difficult difficult though because one of the natures of the vhf uhf bands is they punch through the atmosphere, meaning they're really only line of sight. Your RF is going to come straight out of the antenna, basically, and it's going to go and go and go and keep on going until it's absorbed or gets to space, and then it's just off, off, and away. So because of that, you can't really talk to another state, another country with VHF, UHF. We use HF for that. HF is where it's at for POTA and SODA. So studying for the licenses, there's two two methods to make it really simple for you. Traditional books, uh, link is in the description to traditional books that you can get off of Amazon. We are at an interesting time right now. We are um, going through a questions pool change for the technician license, which goes in the new question pool goes into the uh, to effect at the end of this month, June 2022. So if you're thinking about buying a book, um, go ahead and wait until the question pool swaps or make sure if you're watching this after I originally went live that you're looking at the date range on the book. If it's close to being expired, don't buy it. It's not worth your time because the question pool is going to change. I generally like the Gordon West books, WB6NOA, and the Fast Track series on Amazon. These are all on Amazon, by the way. The Fast Track series also comes in an audiobook form, which I used when driving to work. I found that really helpful when I was studying for my extra license, which um, I got a couple years ago, I, I think. Hamstudy.org is the other one. Hamstudy.org is a free website, and they also have an app that is a paid-for app, but the website is always free. You can just use the website on your phone if you so like to do that. Hamstudy.org is a fantastic way to study for the test. It's very streamlined. It's very simple. They give you practice exams, meaning you know practice tests come out, same test questions, but 
They mix up the order just like you would see if you were sitting down for a test. You take many, many practice tests, many, many practice tests, right? At some point, you're going to get, um, it'll tell you when you've seen all the questions, what percent of the questions you've seen, how many times you've seen them. And it'll start telling you which sections of the test you're not that good at. And those you can then target using the website to show you the sections or subsections within the test that you need to spend more time on. I know uh, there's, yeah. Trust me when I say this, go to hamstudy.org, start taking practice tests, and then look at your history, and it'll show you really fast which sub-elements or subsections you are lacking in, and it'll help you study those questions more prominently. Once you get, I've always said this, people disagree with me, but once you get to about 75% um, pass rate, I tell, I just say go take the test. People are generally way more cautious and careful when they're taking a test versus practice tests. So if you're getting a 75% on practice tests where you're kind of just blase on the toilet uh, in the morning, whatever you do, uh, you're probably going to do just fine when you take the live test. So keep that in mind. All right, so how do you get your license, though? I just said, how do you study? How do you get your license? Uh, there's, there's a couple of ways to do it. You can still test in person, which was the way I did it, I guess the old school way. Back in my day, we had in-person testing, and we liked it, and then COVID came along. And now we have online testing, which, frankly, I think is a, a great idea to do online testing. So two links here. If you go to Google, by the way, we're going to talk a little bit about Google, too. When we get going here a little bit further, if you go to a, if you just type in ARRL, find a test, you'll find a link to a uh, web form that you can just say here, you know, where you're at and say, OK, here's all the locations of testing sites for getting your license. And that works just fine for in-person testing. However, if you want to test online, you can go to hamstudy.org forward slash sessions hamstudy right? Hamstudy.org, the one you were taking your practice exams from? Well, during COVID, they created a method and software to allow for remote online testing. And now they hold these sessions to get people tested online via Zoom and get them their license. I highly recommend, if you can swing it, test online if you want your license very quickly. The FCC has gone paperless, mostly paperless for as much as what they can do. If you test online and pass, you'll have your license within a day or two. Some people have got it same day, which is absolutely insane because I think I waited two weeks or something like that. Back in my day, I waited two weeks. Here's a big, 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 big one. Um, if you are someone who has heard about or has concerns of people knowing your address when you become an amateur radio operator, you need to go get a P.O. box before you take your test, before you go on the FCC's website and create an FRN number, you need to go get a P.O. box. Then you use that P.O. box as your home address for the FCC to send you mail, which they seldom, if ever, do. And that will keep your P.O. box as your home address versus your home as your home address when people look up your call sign. That is the only way to do it. Uh, most effectively in the United States, make sure you do the P.O. Box thing for sure. And do it before, before you create an FRN number and attach all this info to the FCC. Before you get your license. Has to be before. All right, so now you're saying, wait, there's a test? Why is there a test? Why? Because I'm going to answer these questions that I get all the time. Now, I'm not being an apologist. I'm not defending the FCC. I'm not defending all the other countries that have tests. I'm just merely trying to explain why it exists. Given the free and open nature of amateur radio in comparison to other services, right? What were we talking about earlier? GMRS, FRS, the, the baby brother of uh, GMRS. Those radios are locked to a band. And they're locked to channels and they don't have a keypad and frs has a antenna that is permanently affixed to the radio they are consumer goods they are consumer products they are not there to necessarily further or advance the technology of radio um, or do many of the other things that we do in amateur radio right they are commodity items they are 
things to make communication happen, not to create better understanding of radio waves and radio wave technologies. So I believe, and this is me talking, that because amateur radio is such a more open-ended experience, you can go to whatever frequencies you want. You can put big amplifiers on your radio. You can build your own antennas. You can make software that interfaces with your radio and sends data over the air. Can't do data on GMRS, right? Oh, you can a bit, but you know what I mean. You're not sitting there doing chat room stuff um, with your GMRS radio. So the gatekeeping, at least I believe, the FCC is, believes that there needs to be some kind of gate, some kind of barrier, something that helps to protect the quality of the ham radio bands. They believe that it's this test and the levels of the test. And particularly when you go from technician to general, the general test is a bit harder than the technician. Why? Well, HF, one can argue, you are now potentially affecting many, many more people if you run awry with your signal or start doing some bad actor type stuff. So that's part of the reason for that. Um, I'm not sure how to verify this is true or not, but that is what people believe that this that we have to have a test to instill this baseline knowledge in people's brains and they'll just remember this forever and they're trained up and they can be effective radio operators. Me personally I don't really believe that. I think that um I think that it's a speed bump and the speed bump once out of the way the real learning starts. You can't convince me of otherwise because you're not in my brain and you know you don't know how my brain works. So uh, a lot of what I remember from the test is not the stuff that I want to remember from the test. So I'm still grabbing catalogs and textbooks and searching online to relearn those things when I'm sitting down to like look at a circuit, for instance. I don't remember most of that stuff. And if you do, good for you, but most people don't. So advice, knock the test out. Just get it out of the way. You learn more doing than not. So uh, that's what I recommend. If you disagree, that's okay. These are my opinions. You can disagree with them. If you want to spend six months to completely and fully understand every license uh, question, more power to you. If that's what you do for fun, cheers. I want to be on the radio. So I recommend uh, you just take the test if you want to be on the radio too. So you got the license in hand. Now what? Generally, I and I've, I've got thoughts on this one too. New people to ham radio generally seem to gravitate towards VHF, UHF radios, right? They're relatively inexpensive. You put the antenna on top, boom, there you go, start talking. Pretty straightforward. People generally go into one of two directions. They'll get themselves an HT um, or they'll get like a mobile radio because they're out in the sticks a bit. They can't hit the repeaters with an HT, so they need to use a mobile radio, right? All that stuff, you know, great, more power to you. I think most people started with VHF, UHF, most people, most people. These operators are generally working at the higher frequencies. So slinky, compressed slinky, high frequency stuff, line of sight stuff, which can be fun. That's where you get access to satellites, right? FM satellites, the linear, linear satellites. Uh, but it's also geographically limiting, I find. Further, I have had many a story. I don't have this problem. I walk down the street and trip over repeaters. Southern California is the absolute, like, I don't know if it's the densest area for repeaters, but it's one of the densest areas in, I would argue, the world, possibly. Um, anyway, so um, you could live in an area where there's maybe only one ham club and, and maybe only one repeater, and you may not like the people on that repeater, and you may not like the topics of discussion they have on that repeater. Well, if that's where you live and your radio can only talk around where you're at at any one time, that's kind of limiting, right? So that's why, again, I recommend, if you can, get closer and start it out on uh, HF. With some rare exceptions, VHF, UHF transmissions are all line of sight. They're only what you can see. A little bit further, but you get the idea. So I recommend, again, starting out, the, the fast track, the smoothest path to getting started in ham radio. I recommend everybody go do this, by the way. Um, go get yourself a an SDR dongle of some kind. And if you don't want to buy one, I get it. Don't want to put up an antenna. That's okay. 
Link in the description to the Kiwi SDR online software, software defined radio database. It's basically a website that is the interface for a radio. And you can see the radio frequencies scroll up or scroll down on the waterfall. And you can get a complete understanding of this whole parking lot mentality of here's one space in 40 meters for amateur radio. And then look at that, just a little bit below it, that's the shortwave broadcast stations. And okay, cool, let's go look at. 500, um, sorry, 5 megahertz. 5 megahertz, that's WWV, the atomic clock out of uh, Colorado, right? You can see all that with an SDR online, Kiwi SDR or Web SDR, whatever you want to use. And it'll give you a much better understanding of how radios work and what's going on with radios by actually doing, listening to it. And it's free. It's totally free. So link's in the description. But I do recommend the... Um, the the new elec sdr that top dongle if you're on a budget and highly 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 recommend sdr plays line of sdrs i am unaffiliated with any of these companies i will mention though the links in the description to any of them is an amazon affiliate link if you find this helpful and you want to give back a little bit use my link it does help out the channel it doesn't cost you anything else but hey appreciate it thanks okay um, these SDRs are super useful for lots of things too. I use them uh, when I do my antenna testing, when I go to the park, SDRs are the key to making that work and tells no lies. SDR tells no lies. It tells you exactly the power of the signal that it's received. They work beautifully. I love SDRs. Everybody should have them. Oh, and uh, go watch my video on uh, using a cheap Android tablet. You can interface the SDR dongles with a cheap Android tablet, a $100 Lenovo tablet works just fine. So tip, think like you are on your own with ham radio. Okay, here's here's Josh's hot take. Once upon a time, I recommended everyone find a club, and I still do. Find a club, sure. If you find a good club, fantastic. You lucked out. Uh, but what if we pretended we were on our own? What if we pretended we were all our own little island, our own little ham shack floating in the ocean, if you will? How would you find the info you wanted? How would you learn more about ham radio, right? Some people can learn this way where they do things on their own. They look online for resources. They read books. I think, well, some people thrive in those environments. I think everybody, if they assume the mentality that they're responsible for their ham radio career and journey, they will get more out of it and they will grow quicker. So if you are responsible and in the driver's seat of ham radio, I feel like this is a very good mindset to start out on that you are on your own, but if you join a club, you may have a faster time. If you get an Elmer, it may make that journey a little bit faster and knowledge will come a little bit quicker. All true things, but don't expect it to be the only way. You can definitely go your own. If you can function on your own, then you can answer your own questions. How would you do that, per se? Google your questions, literally. Uh, radio, insert radio name here, set up FT8, Google. Uh, insert radio name here, APRS configuration, Google. Right, just all that, right? Anything, the keywords, I, I know... I, this is the ham radio crash course, not the Googling things crash course, but I found that people don't Google effectively. I thought we might have gotten past that, but I think some people have a difficult time with Googling now and then. Keywords are the key points, right? Keywords for the program, the company, the, the model of the radio, all of that stuff is what you need. And here's a hot tip. <laughs> Download the PDF manuals for all your radios. I I love uh, I love me. I love me a good manual. So here's my here's my 818. I just bought this in Las Vegas, right? My manual. But guess what? I didn't aggregate it on anything. I can't search on, on anything. So having the PDF is absolutely what you want because then you can search for what you're looking for after you buy your first radio. Highly important. Always download PDFs. And if you're so inclined and you have a cheap Kindle or cheap e-reader, shoot all of your manuals for all of your things in your life, in your home, to that e-reader. I'm telling you, this will save you so much time. Oh, let me go back. Yeah, Google your questions. Generally, generally you're going to get Google's hits on YouTube, which is going to be good in most cases, but consider the creator. 
Some of us are not all the same. Some of us are different spots in our ham radio journey. That's neither good nor bad. I'm not throwing any shade at anybody here. All I'm saying is if you are looking for a definitive one, two, three, four, five of how to set up FT8, then you may have to look at a couple of videos until you get exactly what you're looking for. QRZ. Hit and miss. Uh, QRZ I found is there's a ton of really good posts. This is QRZ.com, by the way. Keeping this simple, get everybody started in ham radio. There's a website called QRZ.com. It's kind of like Facebook of ham radio. And there's a forum. And in that forum, there are some pretty bad actors that make people feel pretty bad about themselves. And they really like doing it. It's a lot of fun for them. But with that said, there are other posts in the forums that are really helpful with that are ran by really good people that have a really good deep dive in explaining things in effective way so for that i will say qrz is hit and miss you will often sometimes have to dive into qrz to find some information but there you go uh reddit generally good although for some reason it feels like we've got some qrz expats that are going to reddit and they're starting to throw their poop around a little bit. And that's a bummer because I think Reddit's um, it's a better community than QRZ's is on the general. Uh, but yeah, there's some people that are, that are really kind of starting to bring it down. And that bums me out too because Reddit's usually a good place. So what's the best way from my point of view? Participate in an online community. Um, I, I think I can say, and this is again my opinion, I think the, the Ham Radio Crash Course Discord is our shining jewel uh, of the best example of a, an online ham radio community you can have. One of uh, the best, for sure. The Long Island CW Club is fantastic as well. Those guys are amazing. I highly recommend you join them too. Go watch my videos on that. But um, it, the HRCC Discord community is, I think, the best. We've got the some of the best admins. We don't it's a it's a welcoming place. It is inclusive on purpose. And if it's not, you tell the uh, the admins or any of the Elmers, and we'll get it taken care of. Because that's not how ham radio should be. We should be able to work together um, and have fun and answer questions. You know how many questions I've answered five hundred times? The same questions, and I don't get salty with people or make them feel bad about themselves over asking a dumb question. Yeah, they're dumb questions. Yeah, they could have Googled it. Yes, I've posted videos on it. But it's it's human. We're just being humans out here, right? People are people, and people are going to ask questions like that. So I really truly appreciate the HRCC Discord. You guys make that. It, it's my Discord, but it's it's you make the community. Uh, and the Facebook group is pretty good too, but I just don't like Facebook that much. So there you go. Groups.io, sometimes really, really helpful if it's a specific thing. So what was, where was I? Why was I on Groups.io recently? Uh, I can't remember. It was a piece of software. And and that was the, the you, you basically go to Groups.io for like a specific software, a specific radio to get your specific answer. So if you're really hardcore into a particular thing, particular radio, whatever, that's where to go. Hey, 442 people watching right now. I just looked down and saw the number. So thanks so much, guys. I, I really, truly appreciate it. And uh, yeah, it means a lot to me. So, okay. Ham Radio Technology Today. It's a great time to be a ham. I've said this many times. We have access today to well-priced retail radios and loads of quality used gear if you do your homework. Buying an HT, what time have we got? Oh my goodness, we're, hey, we're speeding up. Buying an HT or mobile VHF radio. Um, I already mentioned this, what's your local signals like? You're, I'm in Southern California, I got lots of local signals. If you don't have lots of local signals, skip the HT, go straight to mobile, if you have to do that. If the repeaters are scarce, you might wanna focus your energy towards mobile. I just said that. If you're a techie type person and have digital repeaters, digital ham radio, digital voice, still sending that energy out over the antenna, it's just, what's the, it's modulated, uh, encoded into a digital format, into a digital codec. Audio turns, it's a DAC, so it's an audio to digital conversion. So audio signal comes in, digital, Digital data comes out and gets shot uh, out of the, uh, um, the the radio, out of the antenna. All right. So there's digital modes. That's not really a starting point necessarily from my point of view. By the way, here's my uh, repeater. This is what my repeater uh, forest looks like. And I'd say almost all of them, I could, I could hit them from my house. 
So finding repeaters, repeaterbook.com. If you must start out on VHF, UHF, you will likely want to find a repeater. What is a repeater? I've said it a couple of times now, and some of you who may be starting out for the first time are saying, what is even going on? What is a repeater? A repeater is a big radio, usually on a mountain or on the top of a tower, or the antennas are on the top of the tower, and it allows for simultaneous transmission and amplification and rebroadcasting or retransmission of your signal so that lots and lots of people can hear you. If I have a five watt handheld and I want to talk to, let go back, go back, and I want to talk to a the whole South Bay area from East Los Angeles down to Long Beach, down to where I'm at in Cerritos and Norwalk and all that, I would need to use a repeater. My little handheld can't do it. So we squawk into a repeater like Mount Wilson. It hears my signal. And while it's hearing my signal, at the same time, it's retransmitting my information, my voice on a slightly different frequency and everybody can hear it. That's how repeaters work. Again, black box, real simple. National calling frequencies. If you must VHF, UHF, make sure you have the national calling frequencies loaded in your radio. Again, Southern California, I'm incredibly spoiled. There is always people talking on the simplex and monitoring the simplex frequencies, particularly 146.520. If you don't know what that is, that is the two meter band about in the middle of the about middle of the uh, the frequency space. Again, tight. Whoop. Tight slinky. 146.520 is the two meter calling frequency. It's like the, hey, anybody out there? What's going on frequency that we use? So buying your first HT. When I started out, the budget options, the budget options were $200 and up. It wasn't until the Baofengs hit the market in the, what is it, 2013 to 2015-ish time frame where, time frame where the UV5R just kind of took off like, like wildfire. You expected to pay two hundred dollars, right? You that was just it. You got it. You got yourself a Yesu FT60, and you liked it, and you had, and that was a good radio. It's still a good radio, but you can't compare it to the cost of the Baofengs. We'll talk about that in a, a little bit more on that, except um, in a second. But not all HTs at the bargain basement level are exceptional quality. So even if you're getting thirty dollar, twenty five dollar, thirty dollar Baofengs and TYTs and um, other radios like that, just because they're sub one hundred dollars, that doesn't mean that. How do I want to say this? If you paid more than a Baofeng at twenty five dollars, say you bought one for seventy five dollars, that doesn't make that a good radio. Okay, just keep that in mind. I highly recommend before buying any HT, even though they're incredibly cheap, that you do some research on them, particularly what it's like to program them by hand for repeaters. Highly recommend that you do that. I will tell you, though, that the two that I like that are the cheapy radios is the FT4XR. It's a great little cheap radio. It's 75 bucks to 85 bucks, depending on where the crazy prices are at. And the UV5R. The UV5R is just fine, as well as the Radiotity, um, U, what is it, UVG, UV, UV9G, UV5G, UV, yeah, I think it's UV5G. Anyway, the Radiotity, it's basically a Baofeng that has better filtering in it. So a note to further this on Baofeng. Some, most Baofengs have poor internal filtering and create harmonics. I know those are those are big words for an introduction radio uh, on to radio here. All that means is if I had so if I had uh have my radio on 146.520 meaning 146.520 and I started transmitting. If a radio has bad harmonics, you're going to see the power is going to be output right on 146.520, but then every harmonic you're going to see a little blip of energy, blip, blip, because there's poor filtering on the radio, which is basically making you transmit outside of band, potentially, because China don't care. China don't care about um, filtering. That would be expensive. So keep that in mind. In some cases, a lot of Chinese radios are good. Baofengs, not so much. Quality has improved over the years, though, and many now pass the FCC requirement Part 97 rules. Part 97 is not a topic for this video. It is way too much to get started with, and I only have five minutes left. Please don't end your shopping, your shopping search with the Baofeng, or the Bufwang, or the Bofeng. Uh, there are other better radios for not much more money. Even other Chinese brands deserve another look, like Wushan, or Ocean if you say that, but Wushan is generally what I know them as. 
if you do own a Baofeng and wouldn't have become a ham without its low-cost point of entry, don't sweat it. We're all better off as a community for you being one of us. Don't let anyone shame you because you got a Baofeng. Uh, generally, though, buying mobile radios is... I like mobiles. Mobile radios are not just for the car. I use them in the home as well, although we use uh, that name to reference larger radios with higher output than your HT. Generally, mobile radios are 50 watts on 2 meters and 70 centimeters. So much like the HT, just bigger has a higher power output, making it a lot more useful in most situations. Mobile radios require external power sources and an external antenna. And with a mobile radio, you will be able to work simplex contacts easier. If you hear people on 146.520 or like to monitor it for emergency purposes, like maybe your house butts up to a national forest and you know there are hikers out there, sometimes it's really good to have uh, GMRS radios turned on, HTs, um, mobile radios on national simplex 146.520. Megahertz is really important as well. So my recommendation on starting out for HF. So starting out on HF can seem daunting. There are some tips. We've already talked about SDRs. To be honest, I feel like if you really do spend a little bit of time with SDRs, you'll get a much better idea of what we're trying to accomplish when we talk about getting onto HF radio. Seek recommendations from Elmer's Clubs and Ham Friends, but get second and third opinions. And you can do that by watching YouTube videos, reading reviews like from the ARRL. And there are some really good blogs out there as well, like Thomas Witherspoon. So he's also on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to him. 100 watts should be your benchmark for an HF radio. That's what you're looking for. You want 100 watts output. And a base station radio with knobs, from my point of view, is preferred when starting out. I know there are an SDR, you may have learned, right, have showed yourself ham radio via an SDR, a USB SDR, and you're used to that. Okay, I might give you the nod then if you're doing a radio with a lot of heavy in the menu screen stuff. But generally, I like, I like a good knob, as I say in my videos, for all my UK folks to drive them crazy. Uh, waterfalls will help you understand what is happening, but you, you pay for this feature. Waterfalls are incredibly expensive. They add cost to the radio. Just uh, case in point, that 818 I bought right there, 600, uh, 600 something dollars versus the 705, relatively similar uh, radio. 705 is much newer though, uh, $1,200, right? So, all right waterfall check 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 radios with internal sound cards if you want to do data if you want to do digital modes like shoot data <laughs> out of your radio if i keep saying data you'll get it right uh star trek next generation data no if you want to connect your computer and have your com computer talk to your radio and have your data from your computer get transmitted out over hf uh, you want something with a usb port it's going to make your life a lot easier one cable uh, that's the way to do it. And last for HF, don't skimp on the antenna. Don't skimp at all. Most important. Actually, I think that's not true at all. I, I, <laughs> I had a whole other slide devoted to antennas. For most of us, now we're talking HF antennas. If you're getting started, okay, HF antennas can be incredibly daunting. I appreciate that. For most of us, we will need ha need to use a compromised antenna both in placement, in size, in cost. We're all dealing with compromised antennas and don't let anybody make you feel bad about that aim to build or buy however resonant antennas for your desired bands and you can google this so i just said a term i just said a big word resonant antenna what does that mean so you could google hf resonant antenna plans hf antenna um, hf resonant antenna project on Google. See what you get you get back. You're going to get something that might work just fine for you. An example of a resonant HF antenna is a dipole. A dipole is perfect. And if you add more elements to that dipole, you got a fan dipole, now you got a multi-band uh, dipole. Good stuff. If you'd like to hear um, me explain a little bit about multi-band antennas, go look up the video I posted a week or two ago on the Eagle One antenna. Really interesting antenna, really interesting idea, and I wanted to, to use it as a way to explain to people that there are antenna realities we just face and have to deal with. Uh, so that's why I really like 
resonant antennas. Anyway, go watch that video. Uh, let's see. But, but, don't let the pursuit of the perfect antenna slow you down from getting on the air. That's the biggest thing, the, the biggest line that you must, if you're, if you're doing HF, you, you've got to remember to get on the air. Get on the air is important. Sometimes building a dipole is the best option. It's cheap, easy to make, and will get you a lot of satisfaction when you get it up and running. You'll be really proud of yourself. There's this old saying, um, it's better to be, <laughs> it's, better to, it's better to have uh, a 380 automatic in your pocket than a 1911 on the, the night, nightstand. Well, it's better to have an antenna on the air, a compromised antenna on the air, than a, a perfect antenna in a shed, right? Okay, maybe one more slide on antennas. There can be a lot of ham radio mysticism when it comes to antennas. Fully understanding them is a pretty large task. Take your time, research, research, and research. If you haven't, and you want to get, it's, it's Father's Day weekend, if you want to buy a, a fellow person who's ham curious, maybe a dad, whatever, get them the AWRL handbook. It would be invaluable tool for them to learn um, more about antennas. Somebody, oh, <laughs> Kate MRD, so do I. That's why I said it. I also, I also have one. All right, what else do I got? I think that's it. Questions, all right. Run what you brung, says Pigeon Man. Absolutely. Jody says, for those uh, for those new to the hobby and not sure what they might be interested in, the AWR Handbook Annual has the first section covering the 500 sub-hobbies. Perfect, Jody. Perfect. You always have good drops, and we came to the same conclusion there. I love the handbook. Uh, definitely, definitely get yourself the AWR Handbook. They're, they're inexpensive. I, I think they're a, a good buy. Well, Boy, howdy. I did that in exactly an hour. That's impressive. That was not timed in any way. I will make a mention here. This uh, this whole channel runs off of uh, your support. I do appreciate it. Things like Patreon and obviously membership here on YouTube and hamtactical.com. Sure, Patreon, we love that. Sure, YouTube membership, we love that. But maybe you'd want to buy yourself some merch, maybe some really good coffee. That's not just me saying it. Many people have said it's it's fantastic. And a bunch of other merch. And the merch ideas all come from my podcast that I do with my wife, Leia. Ham Radio Crash Course Podcast. For instance, one of my favorites, still to this day, thank you for Contact 73, which is the old uh, Chinese takeout container um, design. Thank you for Contact 73. We we gotta do a please copy now that I think about it. We gotta do a please copy. Yeah, I love it. I've got to agree. Of course you do. Anyway. All right, everybody. I think we're gonna wrap it up on that one. Big thank you to the patrons. Patron picks is just around the corner because who buddy? Um we have field day next week. Man, next week. Uh, field day next week. I don't even ready for that. I don't know if I'm staying overnight or not yet, guys. So if you're going out there, maybe ping me on, on Discord or whatever, um, to see if I'm going out there. Also, for everybody that's hanging out still right now, we're gonna go to the Discord after chat after this. So if you'd like to follow along, link is in the description. I'll be live on Twitch as well. So hope you join us over there. Um. Yeah, and that would be great. So, yeah, big thank you to the patrons. Appreciate it. Didn't get a lot of questions, but we're burning the uh, we're burning the midnight oil here a bit. Late night stuff. All right. Yeah, thanks, everybody. I appreciate that. I hope the uh, the stream was good this this time. I know it's getting uh, tough. People are getting busy. They're getting outdoors. They're getting ready to go on vacation. So I appreciate a one-hour long stream like this can be a little daunting for people to sit down to. But if you got through it, I appreciate it. And if you enjoyed it, give me a thumbs up. would mean a lot. All right. Hey, the anime. How's it going, anime? And if you follow me on Patreon, um, I'll be dropping the links, um, the slides there, likely tomorrow, sometime this weekend. But it is Father's Day. So, hey, all the fathers out there, appreciate you. I'm sure your kids do too. And uh, we definitely need you to teach your kids and <laughs> your family ham radio. So get to it, all right? <laughs> Everybody have a good Father's Day and a good rest of your weekend. I'm going to the Discord. I hope you join me over there too. 73, everybody.